Kevin Angus is going to be our next speaker. Kevin is a director, Asia specific for Brookies Education Group, a global network housing school in Canada, USA, Russia, South Korea, India, and United Kingdom, and founding head of school Brookies Seoul Campus. Kevin Scotch leads over with 25 years of experience networking with international education and international bachelorate organization. Let's go ahead and welcome Kevin on board. Good uh, morning, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Kevin Skeel. I'm coming to you from uh, London, England, uh, actually just outside London, uh, Hertfordshire. It's uh, very early in the morning here, so I, uh, I, uh, I hope that I, I don't slur my words or uh, uh, confuse items, but uh, I'm here uh, as a, uh, a, a practicing uh, a, a director of Asia for Brooks Education Group, which I currently employed at, but I'm past uh, uh, founding head and uh, various founding heads of schools in Asia. So hence the, uh, the APAC region is, uh, is, is something uh, familiar to me and very interesting, and I'm very appreciative to be included in this uh, in this conference, this uh, digital conference, uh, I believe I should start with a little bit of a caveat, and that uh, you know, uh, just as uh, uh, all of you are experiencing this uh, this tidal wave of online uh, uh, digital uh, education, uh, we are at various levels of uh, preparation and uh, and education in that. I don't pretend to be an expert, but I can certainly tell you that I know what I'm doing with regards to schools and children and parents and communities that uh, support them. So I'm coming to you from uh, the, uh, the grassroots level of a head of school who, uh, at the onset of uh, digital education, was at the forefront in Korea, in South Korea, in uh, when the pandemic broke, the, uh, the country next to uh, China was South Korea, where it exploded. And uh, we were involved in a very quick uh, development of uh, reaction to online learning that uh, served uh, through various uh, support channels, through webinars around the world, to prepare the West as it was moving from East to West to what to expect. So I, I find myself at the forefront of the uh, development of online education in terms of where it is, uh, sorry, where it started uh, to really explode in, in schools around the world and colleges uh, and the preparations that were required and all of the issues that uh, came about as a result of that uh, from the early onset. Now, although uh, our school and my, I was at the forefront of this and the team that were involved in that, we were learning by doing and reacting, but uh, now uh, close to two years on, I can look at this from a little bit of uh, objectivity, and I can say that the transformation that has been taking place and the transformation in schools has also been exponential since the onset of the pandemic. And uh, I think that, that that transformation has uh, a lot to be discussed and a lot to be uh, examined still, but it is happening and it's real. And it is certainly something that uh, is changing all of our lives. I think that uh, for the purposes of this conference and for the purposes of our profession, we have to remain positive and we have to remain uh, conscious of the fact that it is ever present in front of us and something that we have to deal with. Now, uh, there will be differing opinions on the value of it and the risks and the threats. And I'm here to uh, discuss some of those with you as a head of school and a uh, um, various boards around the world. But I think that for the sake of this presentation, I'm focusing on the positive and I'm trying to bring to you uh, a, a conversation that uh, has started with this conference, but it's also something that we can carry on and chat afterwards or in open channel uh, on email or in uh, group uh, discussion later at some point. But the digital transformation in schools. Now, uh, I'm coming out of the private sector, which many of you may find to be uh, one of the... Um, one of the benefits to dealing with rapid change, I think the private sector in schools, and I'm talking about international schools in particular, from my perspective, reacted very well to the onset of digital learning. Uh, they had the technology in terms of hardware, and they had the basic uh, skills and, uh, and set up and apparatus. And depending on the level and the uh, sophistication of a school that you were in, you were able to uh, exercise protocols that would allow you to have distance learning, children at home, uh, teachers either working uh, synchronously or asynchronously as, uh, as time went on, 
and uh, teachers in the building, uh, out of the building, a hybrid model. All of these concepts uh, grew uh, rather rapidly as a result of the transformation that were taking place. And I think everyone here uh, dealt with that in their own way. Uh, if you have children, you know what that is like, and you can offer opinion on that. I know that uh, I have uh, children who are caught in that very difficult age. And uh, although there are several uh, ages that, uh, that had differing, uh, 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 I guess, uh, learning curves to, uh, to this transformation, the age that is most sensitive in my mind was that 15 to 18 age bracket. The, the, the student who was just about uh, growing uh, into that teenage and uh, heading on to the wider world uh, uh, phase of their lives who are suddenly cut off and, uh, and left destitute in some ways. And that aspect has left a great void, but it's also uh, created a tremendous learning curve for a group of society that today is off to university and is dealing with the effects of what we've had to deal with uh, early on, now carrying on further into university. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that later. Digital education is not just about technology. And I think that uh, when we look at the private sector and we compare that to the public sector, and I, I, I know some very uh, well-equipped public schools, and uh, I, I can say as a Canadian and a Swiss, uh, the public sector in some countries is very well fortified and very well uh, uh, situated in terms of its uh, ability to deal with uh, uh, online uh, education and, and this digital transformation. But uh, on the other hand, we all know that in certain parts of the world, access is a real issue. And uh, it was very clear to me early on in the uh, development of this, uh, this switch that was taking place that you know, uh, the idea of a computer or a laptop uh, in the home was sometimes foreign for various reasons to certain families. And it was also a very shared item that uh, had to be dealt with. And how do schools react to that? Well, private schools might have more resources to do that. Public schools certainly uh, came up with all kinds of uh, uh, issues that uh, we can uh, discuss later on. And uh, I think that it's, uh, it's pretty much known how, how difficult that can be when you're, uh, you know, living in one one home with uh, shared devices and you've got uh, expectations from uh, multiple children in a, in a situation of schooling and uh, parents aren't home. Like just uh, imagine the uh, complexities that are involved. But what we're talking about now is really about designing and building an innovative culture within a school, okay? And uh, within the schools and the school groups, and if you're part of a network or if you're part of an individual uh, school or basically your uh, public school back at home, the, the culture begins with an attitude and a, an embracing a change, but also setting policy and, uh, and understanding where things are going with regards to the school, the positions that are created, the linkages that happen, and the, uh, the people that are involved. And uh, that attitude is something that we're going to talk about today. I'm looking at opportunities, threats, and challenges in uh, digital education. And I'm covering these, uh, basically these four areas in, uh, in some detail. And I wanted to share with uh, you my ideas on this, but also to, uh, to come to an understanding through chat or various uh, conversations of just where you think it might be going in terms of uh, the, uh, the challenges that lie ahead. Now, from early observation, I would love to hear from people later on. Um, this is coming from me, and this is at the very onset of... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the pandemic, but I have to say that um, uh, online education actually didn't change anything in terms of the way we educate as teachers, um, even as schools. We still conduct lessons, uh, Socratic teaching methods were still being used, assignments were still being set, and uh, whether we accept or not, uh, exams and tests were still being given. Nothing that we've done in education has changed in online learning. That's an argument that I'd like to put out there. However, uh, despite this fact, online education changed everything for the learner, okay? For the average student, their entire world changed, okay? The average student moved from online, meaning that their entire world of how they communicated, the relationships that they had formed, the connections they had, uh, literally changed overnight. Now, just imagine the impact that might be on an early, uh, on an early years child, you know, age three, four, or five, uh, a, a, a young lower uh, elementary school, uh, grade four and five, at that critical age of 10 and 11. 
Imagine for the young uh, teenager and then the uh, pre-graduate and what that means to their lives, their social uh, connections and their well-being in, in, a, in a school setting as suddenly, suddenly turned into a home setting. The entire element of education and the way we educate changed overnight. And uh, although schools and the way we practice our regular day-to-day uh, -day didn't, we have to be cognizant of the fact that this was a huge dynamic and uh, massive uh, paradigm shift in the way that uh, young people approached schooling in terms of uh, uh, the, the pandemic, okay? So my question to everyone is, is uh, what does it mean to educate? And how is educating a child different from schooling a child? Now, I've uh, spoken on this topic uh, a bit, and I think that uh, it is one that uh, may not be uh, uh, unfamiliar to any of you, but my, my preface, preface for this is that uh, educating a child can happen anywhere, okay? We educate uh, adults anywhere. It can take place uh, uh, at random, it can take place in a formal setting, but schooling someone, and what is meant by the, uh, the term schooling is something entirely different. And that's where I want to place a lot of the emphasis of what is missing in this hybrid model going forward. But schooling itself, okay, what do we see in schooling versus what do we see and understand through educating, okay? Educating a child can happen anywhere. It can happen anytime and in any way. Uh, I think that uh, the vast resources of our teachers, their innovation and their concepts of uh, how to bring uh, these regular taught lessons that they did face-to-face -face once now to an online world, have to give, we have to give teachers tremendous uh, applause for the way they've actually approached online education, dealt with the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the change and that transformation in their own mindset, but also in the innovative ways in which they've tried to react and change the way in their habits of, of, uh, of approaching the learning concepts for uh, uh, reaching children online. Education takes place in an organized setting, okay? It also takes place in a non-organized setting. It takes place in the hallway, it takes place in the classroom, it takes place outside. You know, if you're uh, into equestrian like uh, I am here, education can take place in many forms of learning that you're doing if it's a hobby or if it's an actual organized uh, structured lesson. It simply just takes place. People are learning all the time. Whether they're following a curriculum, uh, or, you know, an instructional manual, uh, you know, setting up an IKEA uh, piece of furniture is, is education in itself, just following that manual or, or learning by doing. But schooling is my argument, and schooling is something entirely different. Okay, uh, it's about community and the cultures within those communities. And what was missing in my mind here is that uh, you, uh, you're in an online world, but you're actually quite far apart from your, uh, your peer, your neighbor, that, that, uh, yeah, that intuition, that sense of uh, understanding of one another, uh, was, there was a sense of loss there, a real meaning. The threat to all this is that we lose the human perspective, we lose that human condition, and we lose the understanding of what it means to appreciate one another when we don't have them near us and we can't communicate freely like over the lunch hour or during break time or after school programming. The schooling aspect is hugely important. It brings out the mission, the values of the school. It's where the school can actually come alive and says, that is what we are, okay? Education is simple. It's a textbook, it's the curriculum, it's what the teachers will uh, uh, bring forward and the students will, uh, will comment on. But to develop a sense of schooling and to understand what it means by that is really to look at how that culture of a school transforms and comes out with some sort of meaning and interpretation. We've all had uh, the experience in, uh, in schools where, or colleges, where you know, that particular school is known for this or they do a particularly good job at that. Uh, that is what I really think is, is missing in this online world. So the real threat here is a sense of loss to the human condition and the human understanding of what it means to be uh, our, our, you know, ourselves, our values, uh, our character. Just look at character itself. Uh, character development in young people it doesn't take place through the curriculum per se of what is being taught and learned. It's something that is taught and learned based on interaction with others and the support you have within that community itself around you. And those are the things that really irk me and uh, really set me off in terms of how we're going to bridge this gap in the online learning. 
So there we have a, uh, an issue for all of us to discuss is like educating and schooling in the modern world, in the digital world. My point is, is that a learning and digital education have proven to happen without much disruption to the ways we educate around the world. However, digital education without schooling raises some eyebrows on what might be lost without what if one is without the other. Now, um, let's uh, just uh, take a minute to pause here. Um, I have uh, two uh, lovely daughters who I mentioned were at that critical age of uh, you know 16 to 18. Uh, have graduated and gone on to university, but they left without graduation. They left without a sense of uh, togetherness at the end. They left without a prom or a, a graduating ceremony. They left without the goodbye. They left without the handshake. They left school without having that final connection and therefore feel a little bit of a loss. They feel like they've been let down. What is it that a school brings to a young person at that particular age is that sense of completion, that matriculated uh, uh, awareness of, uh, of reaching a, a status or a plateau in life that is supported by uh, society, by uh, institutions, and recognized, okay? And I think that throughout uh, schools, wherever you are and whatever schools you're in, whether it be elementary, uh, middle, or upper, that matriculated sense of uh, moving forward and belonging to a culture or community that accepts you for having done something and moving on to the next level is hugely satisfying and rewarding. And without that, there's a, a, feel, a, a sort of a feeling of loss and a feel of uh, abandonment. And I think that that's where we really need to look at how we can bring this forward in a more uh, open and transparent, but also uh, happier way for young people to feel that sense, because I feel there's going to be a disengagement otherwise. So the eyebrows that are being raised is, yes, I graduated, but I didn't have that. Or I did feel I gained this knowledge, but it wasn't the same as I felt it was for so-and-so or X in the past. And that's uh, hugely discouraging for anyone who's been in education for all these years. Now, um, I'm going to move uh, on to another topic just because of timing here. We don't have a lot. It's uh, 20 minutes to talk and about 10 minutes to, uh, to look at uh, chats. But um, the compliance and the data security aspects in schools and uh, colleges around the world uh, is really uh, <laughs> another area where if you were, uh, let's say, uh, technologically uh, um, uh, satisfied with your uh, level of competence here, and all of a sudden you're being asked to do this, it really required much more from the teacher, but also a huge effort on the side of parents and students to comply, but also to understand the systems and the technology and all of the apparatus that was required. And it came very quickly. Now, um, this chart or this uh, graph in front of you that goes from the explorer all the way to the innovator is the development of a school or the development of an individual. This is a Microsoft uh, uh, business uh, uh, strategy that's come across, but it's, it's, it can be applied to education very easily. <clears throat> but where are you on this, uh, this, uh, on this chart or this spectrum? You know, from explorer, you know, the exploratory sense of, you know, uh, I'm getting into the technology. I don't know really how it works. I'm, I'm reacting to it. I'm able to create new ideas on how I might be able to, uh, to, to utilize that to ways envisioning uh, new aspects of change and then actually innovative. Now, to be innovative is very difficult. And I think that that is uh, an area within the school system that uh, is really largely left up to leaders, but also comes from grassroots of, you know, this isn't quite working. Can we do this any differently? And it's all tied to uh, something in schools that is uh, about low tech and low competence. Now, how can you truly be innovative with low tech and low competence? Well, uh, tremendous things are happening and uh, it is happening with uh, the support of technology and it is happening, but it does take a will and a timing and also an understanding that people are going to have to learn and they're gonna have to change, but they're also gonna have to, uh, to move with the, uh, with the situation because I don't think it's leaving. And I can tell you that it isn't leaving, um, one particular example is that uh, I am, as I said, uh, Swiss Canadian, the uh, Ontario in uh, Canada, the Ontario curriculum. I Now, I can't quote exactly, but moving forward, students in uh, public schools will have to choose two, long, uh, two, long, uh, two online courses uh, to, uh, in addition to their taught courses going forward. And I'm thinking, why 
uh, post pandemic, is this coming out as a, um, uh, a rule? <clears throat> you can, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. You can just imagine the impact of uh, online education to the teaching profession. Whether teachers uh, have been kept in their particular uh, country teaching abroad or to kept in their schools teaching locally, it has really taxed and put a huge strain on educators that has actually forced perhaps some of them to leave the profession or to scale back. And in that, online education provides a, uh, a cost, uh, cost scenario that is more favorable to public schools. Hence, the public schools could see that within a menu of, say, six to eight courses that a, a teenager would take in a, uh, in a, given, uh, in a given day or year, um, these uh, could be offset by two being online. Now, the advantages of that are clear, you know, freedom and flexibility and some, uh, you know, uh, greater access uh, for, uh, for choice is, is definitely there. But it's certainly something to, to think that in the current world, this innovative uh, sense is something that even in the schools today is requiring students to be uh, aware that they're going to go to school part time, but that hybrid model is going to have uh, a huge impact. Now, Again, another case study, and it was told to me, but it's, it's something to, to bear in mind that uh, during the pandemic, okay, and I'm going to play this into context with schools and children in a minute, but the average 80 year old, in order to uh, keep up to date <clears throat> with their grandchildren or peers or even with society, uh, you know, they had to develop very quickly the skills that were never really given to them or never really accepted or didn't really fit into that. Uh, that age bracket as a uh, as a as a as a as a as a core uh, skill set uh, for the public sector, sorry, for the private sector to focus on, but that eighty year age group uh, that you know the seniors of the world who really felt that they were losing sight with their grandchildren, they couldn't find a way to communicate. They had to learn the systems on how to connect with their grandchildren. They developed in themselves a exponential growth in, the, in, in uh, technological skill and development in themselves that has an, had an impact on the private sector of uh, technology. And if we look at that and we see that exponential growth, okay, the average 80 year old, I'm just uh, making a, a, a purely uh, open statement here, has taken uh, from zero to 100 in terms of their technological skills for simply connecting to Zoom or you know, going onto the internet or using a mobile phone has grown immensely around the world, okay? Now, project yourselves five years from now. What does that age bracket group, okay? Let's say your average 60 to 80 year olds now demand of the market in five years. Well, I think that same example is that although the exponential growth in that 60 to 80 group will demand so much more of technology and demand uh, so much more of that sector uh, that was left uh, relatively uh, uh, vacant in the past is going to be a huge um, uh, development and uh, opportunity for uh, firms around the world and companies to, uh, to see access uh, for that group. Now, students and children around the world have experienced the same growth. It may not have been so wide as a development, but it certainly has grown in maybe more in technological skill. And keeping up with that means that within five years, we're going to see technology. And as you can see from this conference, the, the amount of uh, growth in Asia alone for this particular field is off the charts. Online education, digital literacy, digital education, is moving at such a fast speed, it's projected to be a billion dollar, a multi-billion dollar uh, industry in just a matter of years. And I can see wholeheartedly from that based on this one example using the senior sector in particular. So when we're looking at opportunity and challenges and the, uh, the issues that go with that, I think that it's clear that we can focus on all of the opportunities that uh, technology can afford. I've never seen so much available to so many, so fast, uh, so quickly, and so readily as it has in the last uh, few years. And I think that uh, what's uh, limiting some of that is our ability to focus and identify what is necessary, but our routines have changed, our habits have changed, and also our day-to-day -day, uh, operations have changed, all of which is giving uh, great open, uh, um, uh, uh, open, I guess, um, uh, opportunity for technology and the market within that to react. Now, 
Um, if I went on to discuss all of the challenges that are there and all the opportunities, I think I would uh, be uh, here forever. I think we'll leave that to the ones that you want to focus on specifically afterwards, but I would like to go on and discuss particularly some of the compliance and data security matters that affected us in Korea and our schools in Asia and then our schools in, in Western Europe uh, as this uh, pandemic spread across from East to West. It came early on to me as a head of school that the uh, issue with uh, data and uh, online learning and compliance between schools and the communities we support was that we needed to look at our existing standards. Okay, Now, I won't uh, be out of sorts by saying that uh, some of our policies were outdated, some of them didn't apply, some of them were completely ridiculous altogether with regards to looking at how the world was uh, reacting to what we were trying to provide. It was very clear that certain positions within the school had to be created. The innovation officer, uh, the coordinator for technology across the school or particular age groups, the way in which we used uh, ICT and the, uh, in, the in, in my particular case, the Dean of Information Technology to support parents and students and the engagement of technology and the innovation and the tools necessary and the guidance within the senior leadership team now where IT is a central part of our uh, discussion and, uh, and, and strategy going forward. So our existing standards had to be re reviewed and the standards also then called into check many of the uh, issues that were at the forefront with regards to challenges in the 21st century. Privacy law, uh, GDPR rules. Uh, as this is coming on, you have uh, you know, new rules of engagement with regards to uh, the internet protocols, uh, data protection, all of this, hugely important matters and things that you don't know really how uh, uh, technology is abusing or making use of your own data with or without your permission. So this has also had a huge impact on schools and it's also caused schools to be very centralized and very controlled for that matter. And I think we can all understand why. The on online security uh, matters and the procedures that we have in schools to protect young people and our teachers, I might add, from uh, the abuses that exist needed to have strict control. Now, I've had a, uh, a number of phrases that I've been known for over the years, but uh, I've got it later coming up, but common uh, strict policies or strict governance for common expectations, okay? Tough policies, really tough policies. I mean, like this is permitted, this is not permitted for common expectations. Now, if you can stick that in your mind and keep that in your head, that'll be a good one for anyone going into senior leadership or who is actually in senior leadership at the moment. But if you have a tough policy and you are cognizant of what is a common expectation in the world, then those two will align. But if you have a weak policy and a common expectation, it falls apart. So if it's tough at the start, then you know exactly what you're going to get uh, when the outcome is reached, okay? Cloud-based storage. Um, I didn't know anything about this uh, a few years ago, but you know, uh, those who are operating schools worldwide or those who are uh, in schools, uh, whether it's public or private, where is the server kept? And if the server is kept in local or in foreign land or in the, uh, in the uh, cloud and operated by a foreign country, what are the limitations to that? What are the laws that stipulate around that? These questions were hugely interesting when it came to our senior leadership team and forced us to look at cloud storage base where we knew the laws were uh, evident for ourselves and not uh, foreign to, uh, to ourselves and our students. I'll leave that with you for a minute, but uh, it's very important. And uh, I have uh, certain ideas on that going forward, but uh, where information and data is stored and the laws that exist within those countries is a huge issue for, uh, for many international school heads. Accessibility standards, okay. I think that we've talked about that a little bit, but you know, uh, entering into the school now it's required to have a, a laptop or you have to have a certain uh, knowledge of education or you have to go through a particular course in education for, uh, for that age group in order to meet the needs today of, uh, of uh, digital alignment. Compliance and registry reports, how do, you, uh, how do you find these systems, the people involved in those systems in the school, and keeping up to date. Trying to keep up to date and also uh, financially uh, uh, um, um, uh, aware of where the bottom line lies, but it is now becoming uh, an issue where uh, the low-tech 
Low tech, low cost is the most important thing that we can look at. And then what can you actually do with low tech and low cost and be innovative? That's the challenge. And obviously high tech and high, high cost will yield more, but it's not necessarily going to be as accessible to everybody. And good compliance and online education are everywhere in terms of being uh, viewed and shared practice and good uh, networking within that uh, group of schools, uh, be it the Council of International Schools, or if you're looking at the different regions in Europe or wherever it is, but getting involved and being aware of who is doing what and how and sharing that good practice. These are all very important aspects when it came to the compliance and data security matters for my senior leadership team at the early onset of the pandemic and uh, where we are today uh, moving forward. Now, there we have it, tough policies for common expectations. If there's anything I can leave uh, this group with, and that's uh, future heads or anyone in senior leadership, is that in order for teachers and conditions for them to have safe and good practice, the protection of students and the protection of staff, it is paramount these days that they know upfront the expectations of the school, what will happen if things are broken, and the expectations of what they're to do on the day-to-day -day practices of uh, online educating. I think that um, with regards to access, I, I happen to uh, be a part of various uh, boards, as I mentioned, and I'm working around the world. Um, now, we had, whether it's private or public schools, the access to online and access to internet and broadband, it is vastly different from uh, what it might be in some of our better and best equipped schools. Things that you would expect to be normal are certainly not normal when your broadband cuts out or when the internet uh, shuts down or when there's controls put over top of things. So you can't always rely on this and it's gonna be very challenging to meet the needs of everybody. Uh, and, and that's what really worries me most about this, uh, uh, this onset of uh, uh, online or hybrid learning is that we're really creating a, a two tiered system of the haves and have nots in this world. And uh, I think that you know, schools that have can certainly do a lot more to schools that have not. And I think that anyone who is in a network school or anyone who's working with uh, children uh, in different schools around the world, there's a massive amount of support that being given by those who can to those who cannot. And I'll leave it at that for now. But the role of the new digital educator still requires one simple clarification. Know your students. I would mention this uh, in a faculty uh, uh, opening at the start of the year. I would also mention it at midpoint of the year. The problems in educating young people happen when teachers or any educator fails to know who they're teaching, okay? And that comes down to not understanding who they are, what their concerns are, what they're dealing with, where they're coming from, and all of this is simply com considered in a, uh, in a discussion, in a format that is almost uh, step 101 in the book of good teaching. When you're online, that still same practice is actually uh, necessary, but I would say now even more necessary, and it also has to include the parent. Why does it include the parent? Because you need to know, is that parent home? Is that parent even uh, aware? Is the parent able to create the atmosphere for learning that is demanded of the school and of the student at different ages in that group? And we're not even talking just about teenagers here. We're talking about imagine online learning, and you all know this from early years and the uh, development within that. Okay, now I'm going to move on here, but uh, safeguarding. Um, I think that uh, with regards to chat and uh, my timing, I'm just, if I'm a bit rushed, we'll uh, have to move a bit faster. But the agreement that comes at the start of the year between parents and teachers and students is really an agreement and acknowledgement that you are signing a pact in the school that you understand what is expected and what is expected of you in terms of the year. Uh, conversations that are happening uh, between the carer and the pupil, the reporting of concerns and how that happens for teachers, what is meant for a teacher with exploitation and online? Uh, what is meant by bullying and, and sharing of sexual images, which is absolutely abhorrent. But uh, I think you have to have these conversations with, uh, with teachers and schools and also with students in, in, the, in the world today. It's becoming very clear that the world is, is among us very fast. And as words were said, uh, 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 <laughs> the world is upon us very quickly. I, I don't have to quote quickly in my head, but uh, online safety protocols for parents and students is absolutely known and necessary, okay? 
Um, good pastoral care. Now, for some of you in schools, if you, if you have a counselor, terrific. If the counselor is good, even better. Now, how many counselors uh, are required for an online school versus a regular face-to-face -face school? In the face-to-face -face school, I don't know if you're aware, but you would see a counselor maybe once a year if you were lucky. In, in, well, at least I did. I, you, know, you, wouldn't, I call, you wouldn't go to a counselor unless you were called in. And uh, I think I was only called in prior to university chat and uh, you know, what I was doing. And that was in the public sector in, in Ontario. But in pi private schools or in an online school, the counselor's role takes a larger and more important role. And it also takes a more necessary uh, regularity in its role, you know, keeping in touch and, uh, and dealing with that. I think the profession of counseling has grown uh, immensely in terms of need. I don't know whether in terms of uh, uh, capability, but it's certainly in terms of need uh, uh, worldwide. Guidelines for teachers now part of their actual job description and what is needed and how you actually do that. And the personal data and uh, GDPR rules, as I mentioned, have to be known and people have to understand the limits to uh, what it is for um, being a successful educator online. Now, I'm going to stop there. I believe that should be close to uh, 20 minutes and I'm going to move over to some questions here and I'm going to give you a minute. But um, uh, one question that I have here from IS is, uh, what are some of the challenges that may exist in digital transformation in school? Okay, so um, I think that I've covered some of that, and I'd be happy to, uh, uh, to, to see your opinions on this. But um, the transformation is, um, as I said, uh, I was, uh, it was monumental, okay? And the, uh, the challenges really are coming down in the teacher profession. Teachers went into education because they uh, wanted to do good. They wanted to give back. And they also wanted to do something with their lives that they signed up for. And that was to work with young people in a classroom. Not every teacher signed up to be online in a computer, in a stale office, or working at home without the camaraderie of a colleague or a peer. And without that... Uh, stage on the stage attitude of where, you know, you can actually be in the classroom and really pull in and unite uh, a fever in terms of uh, student uh, uh, clarity and understanding on a topic. Therefore, we've got a huge issue with the uh, challenges that lie, but it's also one of those opportunities that if you are a good educator, you can still be a good online educator. And there are differences in the way you approach that, but you still have to know your audience and where they're coming from. Great. Thank you, Mr. Kevin. I think uh, we have uh, run short off of the time. Uh, we need to have a hard stop now. A uh, very informative session. We've uh, crossed 15 more minutes into the break time. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we're going to share all the questions with you uh, on an email so that you can reply back to all the delegates. It was a very informative session and we are glad to have you uh, in, as, as part of the Digital Learning APAC Summit. So uh, thank you for uh, you know, the, the session and looking forward to have you in the future sessions as well. Cheers. Thank you, sir, for running late. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Kevin. You have a good day. You too. Bye. Cheers, bye. Amazing session. Thank you so much for being a part of it today. It was a privilege to have you with us.